we're looking at this 23rd Psalm where we see a prescription for people under pressure. And it's interesting how each one of these verses in this very familiar Psalm deals with this subject. Today we're looking at the second verse in the 23rd Psalm, and that second verse in particular deals with what we do when busyness takes over our life. When busyness takes over our life. That's what we're looking at today. And I want to invite you to stand with me. And we're going to read just one verse, verse 2, together. Read it with me. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Now I want you to look at two things in that verse as we begin to let it unfold for our, us. He has to make us do something. It says, he makes us what? Lie down. And then he does what? He leads us. But he can't lead us until we lie down. Only when we submit to him can he lead us. Let's pray. Our Father, give us submissive spirits. We pray you would... Let us lie down in the green pastures of your righteousness. We pray, Lord Jesus, you would lead us today to still waters where we can be refreshed and replenished and know that we have been with you. Bless your precious people with your word today. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. From time to time, I've talked to folks who have the idea that if they give their life to Christ, He will give them more to do. And they hesitate because they already have more than they can do. But this is not the kind of life that God wants us to have or to live. In fact, if you turn over just a few chapters to Psalm 127, in the second verse of 127, here's what it says. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Now that simply means that God wants us to get the proper rest that we need. So if you are the kind of person who is prone to burning the candle at both ends, pay attention today. God wants you to live a full life, but He's not going to put more on us than we can do. In fact, when we give our lives to Jesus, what He will do is to take some things away from us that we don't need to be doing and help us to rearrange the priorities in our life so that we're not so busy, it affects our relationship with Him. A CNN poll said 59% of all Americans would like to slow down and relax more. People are working more today, but they are enjoying it less. So I want to share some things with you from God's Word that will help us to know what we can do when busyness takes over our life. This is the way to lie down in green pastures of God's righteousness. This is the way that you can sit beside the, the still waters of God's peace. And it begins first with realizing your worth. Realize your worth. The reason most people have a tendency to overwork is because they confuse their work with their worth. We think if we work a whole lot, if we achieve a whole lot, then we're worth a whole lot because we have a tendency to confuse who we are with what we do. When we meet a person for the first time, we find out their name and usually one of the first questions we ask is, what do you do for a living? That's because we think we get our worth from our work. 
But the Bible doesn't teach that. We're valuable to God regardless of what our work is. Many of you may have grown up with a little phrase in your mind. Somebody said to you, you're a nobody. Maybe a teacher told you you would never amount to anything. Maybe, uh, by the way, a teacher like that ought to be fired. Amen? A teacher ought to never say that. Nor should a parent. Listen, a parent. It's not fit to be a parent who would say something like that to a child. Be careful how you use your words. We meet someone and and maybe somebody says something like that to us. You're never going to amount to much. And the real reason that we tend to overwork is because we say, I'll show them. I'll prove my worth through my work, through my accomplishments, through my achievements and yet the truth is we never really are able to accomplish enough to be satisfied it's like that little saying sticks and stones may break my bones but names will never hurt well that's not true they do hurt words hurt long after a bone heals you carry the wounds of words in your heart for years and years Many years later, you still hear that little voice inside and you've got to prove your value. You've got to prove your significance by overworking so you never slow down. And that's faulty thinking. And God says this in James 1.18. He says, of His own, he, bought, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be kind of first fruits of His creatures. That means that God decided to give us life through Jesus Christ so that we might be the most important of all the things that He made. You are the most important creation of God. The most important thing that He made. God says we matter more than all the rest of creation so we don't have to prove our worth because God makes no junk. Amen? God made you. And He made you special. And He loves you. And if we really understand and feel we are worthy to God, it will change our life. And here's how. You see, when you realize God loves you, and when you love yourself the way you ought to, you won't care whether other people love you or not. It's very liberating. It's very freeing. You just won't care. When we realize our worth, we're not going to spend our whole life trying to win the approval of other people. But we do need to realize how valuable we are to God. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, Your heavenly Father feeds the sparrows, and you are more valuable to Him than they are. Now, if God notices a little bird falling to the ground, don't you think God will take care of you and me? There's nothing that we can ever do in life to make God love us more than He already does. He loves us. It's not based on our performance. It's not based on our work. It's based on who God is. So we don't have to prove our worth by overworking. Jesus has engraved your name on the palms of His hands. He took those nails for you and me. And it's a reminder of how much He loves us. And every time Jesus looks at His hands, He reminds Himself of how much He loves you and how much He loves me. He engraved our name on the palms of His hands with those nails. And when you get to heaven, you're going to see that. And you're going to realize your worth. Here's the second thing the Bible teaches. When busyness takes over our life, we need to step back and realize our worth, and then we need to enjoy what we have. Enjoy what you have. Ecclesiastes 3.13 says that we should enjoy what we work for because it is God's gift. Do you know it is possible to be so preoccupied with getting more that you don't enjoy what you have? We get into a syndrome that I call the desire to acquire. And we try to keep up with the Joneses, but what we don't realize is that the Joneses just refinanced or filed for bankruptcy. Somebody said, we buy things we don't need with money 
we don't have to impress people we don't even like. We try to get more and more and we get overextended financially. And we spend all of our time making payments on the things that inevitably make our relationships begin to deteriorate. And that's not the way God wants us to live. As a pastor, I've seen a lot of deathbeds through the years. I've never had one person say to me as they drew their final breath, I wish I had worked more. I wish I had spent more time at the office. But I've had a lot of them say, I wish I'd spent more time with my family. I wish I'd spent more time serving others. I wish I'd spent more time with the Lord. You see, we, we get all these things, but we're not going to take them with us. You never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. And you're not going to take it with you. The great things in life are things that we don't have to work to kill ourselves over. Are you understanding me? Amen? Enjoy what you have. Here's the third thing. Realize your worth. Enjoy what you have. And then if you want to deal with this busyness when it tries to take over your life, limit your labor. Limit your labor. Now the Bible teaches that we should work. And the Bible teaches that if we don't work, we don't eat. But we have to make a conscious decision to make time for other things besides work. We need to intentionally schedule time alone with God and with our family. And that's especially true for those of you who are self-employed. Because our tendency is to never stop working. You may have office hours from 9 to 5, but you, you bring it home with you all the time. And if you're not careful, you will not limit your labor, as Scripture teaches us to do. And then there are those of you who are single parents, and, and I commend you because I don't know how you do it. How you work and manage a family at the same time. But you have to be careful. You of all people have to set parameters for yourself. You see, our best requires rest. That's important. Spend time beside the still waters. A lady called her pastor one day and she was upset. She said, I called all day Monday and I couldn't get through to you. And the pastor said, well, I'm sorry, but Monday's my day off. She, she got mad and she said, the devil never takes a day off. pastor said, well, you don't want me to be like him, do you? <laughs> in Exodus 20, the Bible says, we have six days in which to do our work, but the seventh day is to be a day of rest dedicated to God. You see, God says one day off every week is the rule. That's the fourth commandment. That's number four of the top ten. God places a premium on not getting so busy that we forfeit our relationship with Him and with our family. So how do we do this? The Bible calls this the Sabbath. Sabbath means a, a day of rest and Jesus said the Sabbath was made to benefit man. Colossians says it doesn't matter the day as long as you choose one day a week. So, so what should you do on your Sabbath? What should you do on the day you choose each week for your Sabbath? Well, first, rest your body. Rest your body. If you don't, your body will make time to rest itself. Either in the hospital or with a cold or, or flu. During the French Revolution, they outlawed Sunday as a day of rest. But within a few years, they reinstated it, not for religious reasons, but because the health of the nation collapsed. They were all burnt out. Do you feel guilty when you relax? Do you? Jesus didn't. He took time off. Are you busier than Jesus? Is what you're doing more important than what Jesus did? Rest your body. Second, recharge your emotions. What things recharge you emotionally? We all need quietness. We need to spend time in the green pastures. 
We need to spend time at the still waters. We were made for relationships. And there was an article in Time Magazine that talked about how stress and anxiety and depression was so prevalent in our society because of the lack of trusting relationships. And then refocus your spirit. Now that's worship. That's what worship is. It's refocusing our spirit. Worship brings everything into perspective. When you come to church and you're dealing with a big problem in your mind and your heart, worship has a way of just putting that in the proper perspective. And you have more energy to deal with it and more understanding of what to do with it. So we need time alone with God every day. And listen, may I say to you, if you're too busy to have daily time alone with God, then friend, you're too busy. Can you say amen? You're too busy. So we lie down in green pastures. We spend time beside still waters. When busyness takes over our life, Scripture teaches us to realize our worth, to enjoy what we have, to limit our labor, and number four, adjust your values. Adjust your values. We have to change our thinking about what is important. Ecclesiastes 4 tells us that people work so hard to succeed because they envy the things their neighbors have. Yet in Mark 8, 36, Jesus said, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Is it worth it? You may have a great income, but are your children really getting the parenting they need? I had more fun the past two weeks than I've had in many years. And I didn't do anything but spoil four grandbabies. I mean, that's it. I, they crawled all over my head and everything from my head to my feet. And I loved it. I sopped it up. You know what that means? Sop it up. I sopped it up. If you like to eat biscuits and gravy, you know what it means. Now, I enjoyed that. And we need from time to time to to have those times when we enjoy that. But I learned to rest my body because one day... I was holding the baby, the youngest, in my arms, walking across the swimming pool, and I hit a slick spot. And when you see the arms and legs of a six-foot-six man flying across a pool, that's something to see. And I didn't want the baby to get hurt. And so I held him up as high as I could because I knew I was going down. And I've got a great big blue elbow right here. And I've got a big blue knee. And the next morning, I got up and I felt pretty old. <laughs> but we rest our body. We come to the still waters. And then here's the fifth thing. And the last thing. Exchange your pressure for God's peace. Exchange your pressure for God's peace. You see, you may need a vacation, but the truth is a vacation may help our physical fatigue, but it, Scripture tells us it's not going to help the emotional and spiritual fatigue we face. The only thing that will help us when we are spiritually dry is a vibrant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to help. You can go on vacation, but when you come back, the pressures are still going to be there. The problems are still going to be there. So what do we do? More than just taking time away, we readjust our values and we exchange our pressure for God's peace. Now a little child does not like to lay down and rest. Have you ever tried to get a child to take a nap? Have you ever, tried, have you ever seen a baby fighting sleep? Resistance to rest is a mark of spiritual are a mark of immaturity. And if we're always working and we never take any time to rest, it's an indication of our spiritual immaturity. So rest. Pastor Mike told me a minute ago, he said, I'm going to be spiritually mature this afternoon. <laughs> and, and he's got it right. That's what we should do. We should rest. We need a relationship with Jesus. To help us set the pace in our life. 
So let the Lord be your pace setter. Don't rush. He'll, he'll make you stop and rest at intervals. He'll make you lie down. And He'll restore your serenity. He'll lead you to calmness of mind and give you the guidance of His peace. And even though you may have many things you need to accomplish, you don't have to fret because this psalm tells us His presence is with us. And He keeps us in balance. He gives us refreshment and renewal in the midst of our activity. We need a pace setter to set the pace because we have a tendency to go too slow or to go too fast. And the only person that is wise enough to do that is the person who knows you better than you know yourself. And that's Jesus. Let Jesus be the pace setter of your life. Turn to Matthew 11. And let's look at a verse as we finish. Matthew chapter 11. And look at what Jesus said here in verse 28. Eleven twenty-eight. Read it with me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's Jesus' invitation to you. Come to Him. Turn from sin and bondage and the things that weigh you down. Turn to Jesus. Let Him have control of your life. Let Him forgive your sin. Let Him come into your life and give you peace and joy and the assurance of eternal life. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And all God's people said, Father, now move among us in this invitation. Those who need to receive Christ, may you give them a desire and willingness to respond. Those of us who know Christ, but we have gotten to the place where busyness has taken over our life. We pray that today you would help us to be honest enough to admit that to you and to lie down before the green pastures, to sit beside the still waters. And to let the one who knows us better than we know ourselves to give us his rest and peace. Amen. And we're going to stand and sing, and the invitation today is for you to come forward to receive Jesus as your Savior, to come forward to unite with this church. This is the first step, and we invite you to come as we stand.